So this is the third in the series of Habakkuk. The whole series is called From Perplexity to, to Purpose. It's taking us a little while just to get to living on purpose. We start out with a very perplexed Habakkuk who was asking great questions of God, asking, Lord, um, you know, what's going on? There's this moral and social decay in our society, and you're raising up the Babylonians, these evil Babylonians, as, as an instrument of, of discipline. Lord, you know, why are you doing that, and what, what's going on in a, in a struggling, evil, and corrupt society? And today, it's called the saved soul. We've looked at the, uh, the, the soul that is troubled, it's doubtful. We looked at a, a soul that becomes settled. And today, you know, what does a, a saved soul look like? And this text in, from, from last, the end of, of last week's chapter, Habakkuk 2, verse 20, says, The Lord is in His holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. What a text. What an amazing text. Jackie from the school next door was bringing her little children across. You know, they're quite small. She was bringing them across here earlier in the week because they're practicing for their sort of play they have at the end of the year. And so when she got to the door, she was like the Pied Piper with all these little people behind her. And she was going, shh. But of course, they weren't shhing at all. They're excited. They were excited because they were going to come and they were going to have fun and they were going to sing and they were going to do different things. How difficult is it to keep a little child quiet when he or she just wants to celebrate or wants to do different things? Or, uh, but, but imagine, friends, let all the earth be silent before a holy God. Imagine what it would be like if, if from the littlest soul to the, the most senior person in our country, from the president to uh, the pastors to everybody, you know, imagine if we were silent before a holy God, maybe saying, God, you know, let's hear what you've got to say. Imagine, imagine if you as a person, as a family, as a group, as a, as a town, as a city, as a nation, as a continent, you know, as, as a globe, imagine us being silent before a holy God. Say, God, you, you, know, you tell us, you speak to us. And apparently Habakkuk was, was silent enough for a while to hear God. Imagine if you were a, a referee between England and South Africa and you consulted in that last moment, you know, was that a shoulder charge or wasn't it? Because one day you'll stand before a holy God. <laughs> Imagine, friends, what it would be like for us to, to be quiet before God for a moment because, because He's holy and just and true. And, and Habakkuk, remember we left him last week and he was, he was, he was on on his watch, although he wasn't understanding what was going on, he was the watchman on the wall. And so, and so he, he hears from God. He hears from God. And this, this, we've gone from a, a perplexed Habakkuk. And we've now, you know, we, we, we've got this, this praying Habakkuk in chapter 3. That's, that's where, where we've come to. And there's this prayerful song that emerges in his heart. And, 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 and I want you just to read the text. Read it is Habakkuk 3, verse 2. Have a read, and, and you see what's the critical word in this text. What is it that, that Habakkuk has discovered as he's looked at his own, you know, you could, you could call it the church or the people of God. They're in social and moral decay. They're reflecting society. And then they've got the Babylonians pressing in. What, what does he discover? What do you think the key word is? Shout it out to me if you think you've, you've got it. I'll give you a clue. It's in the third line. What is it? Sorry? Revive. That's what he comes to. He, he knows, friends, that no matter what is going on in his own life and in the state of his nation, in the state of his people, there's only one thing that is going to change. His, you know, this public change that he wants, and it's going to begin with revival. And he wants God to... To, to do what he has done in the past, even though he sees a corrupt and evil world. He sees, you know, in the midst, the text says, in the midst, in other words, in the midst of the years or the newer translations, today, today, God, do what you did in the past. What did he do in the past? What's he referring to? As you read further in chapter 3, well, he's talking about the Exodus. He's talking about how God reached down. His people are under 430 odd years of slavery under Pharaoh. He reaches down and he, he, he takes them out. He sets them free. He saves them. But here's the thing, friends. We're not just saved from something. 
We are saved into something. We're saved from a life of corruption and death and distraction into a new life of hope and being born again in Jesus to live. A new, and that's what happened to Israel. As they came you know, on, on the way to the promised land, God gave them His law. That would redefine who they were. They were to live as a people loved by God so the nations would see that they were loved by God. And so the law was given to them. They were saved from slavery into this new life, going to a new life. Could you say amen to that, friends? Hasn't God done that for you and I? You were saved from something into a new life in Jesus Christ. And so all this corruption and this, this, this reality that's going on around him, he knows that only revival, only revival will bring the change, the public change. That he, could we say that, friends? That unless God brings revival to his people, Things are going to continue as is. And so Habakkuk cries out, and I hope you, you know, so, so you can put it in there. It's only revival will bring the public change that he desires. In reality, what's, so, you know, as, as you look further down in the text, what's, what's the starting point of, of revival? Oh, Lord, the text says, I, we're just looking at that text in a little more detail. Oh, Lord, we're still on verse 2. Oh, Lord, I, oh, Lord, I have heard your speech, or I've heard of your fame, and I was afraid, and I, I stood in awe, or I stand in awe of your deeds. This is what you could call the, the little big principle. The little big principle. Who does, who does God first bring revival to? He brings revival, yes, Lucas, he brings revival to me. It starts with me. It starts with me when I realize how small I am in the presence of a holy, huge, almighty God. That's what had happened to Habakkuk. It had happened to him on the wall as he's waiting and he's watching for God. He suddenly realized how small he was and how huge God is. It begins with me. Do you remember this is almost like Job. Job, as you journey with Job and you wonder what on earth is going on in his life. Job, this man loved by God, righteous you know, before God, praying for his family every day, interceding. And suddenly God allows Satan to test him as an instrument of discipline in his life. And he gets to this place, and as you progress through the back chapters, and finally Job says, I had heard about you, but now I've seen you. See, that's the difference, friends. When all the talking is done, I've heard about you. It's almost at Habakkuk. I've heard about you. I've heard about these things, God. But now I want to see you. I want to see you. Could we, friends, in our land, where we are as a people, don't we want to see God? Don't we want to see God revive His church? It'll always begin with His people, friends. You know, as you look at the bribery and the corruption, and you say, uh, uh, ah, yes, you know, go to jail. Get that one in court. That person, whether he's white or black, whether it's Steinhoff or whether it's, you know, whatever it may be, you know, and you say, ah, justice wells up in your soul. But it starts with us, friends. It starts with his church, and it started with Habakkuk. It started deep down. And the interesting thing, when God begins revival, often it's not the high-profile politicians. It's just local people like you and I who start gathering in a little group, and they start seeing the holiness of God and the depravity of a human heart, and they start crying out on God, God, revive us. And, and friends, if you and I were, were in the 1860s, is anyone here who was born in 1860? I know that Thelma is 98 years old, but is anyone here who was born in 1860? So if you were alive in 1860, and you lived in the Western Cape, which is a lovely place, which is where I come from, but I love the Eastern Cape more now. You know, I only love Western Province when they're winning anyone alive back then. So the church in the Western Cape was in crisis. In fact, there was depravity. There was a struggle. There was oppression. There was black and white realities. There was, there was colonialism. There was all the kind of stuff we're dealing with today. And there was a shortage of pastors in, in, in the local churches. They, they struggled with, with language. There was Dutch-speaking people. You know, Afrikaans was emerging. There was identity crisis. And um, it was a battle to just to make a way in, in everything that was going on. But friends, behind the scene, God was at work. This holy, sovereign, loving God we've sung about today, He was at work. 
And he poured out his grace and his mercy. And he was moving a couple of people. In fact, a guy called Andrew Murray. You might have heard of him. Nicholas Hoffemeyer. Gottlieb van der Linden. These Dutch, and, you know, these folk. And, and, and revival started with them. In fact, in a little, in a little gathering in, in Worcester, or Worcester as it's become known, God started an amazing work. It's called the Forgotten Revival of 1860. Ken jy al mense? Het jy geweet, het plaas gevind. In 1860, revival flooded Southern Africa. God came to meet with his people, just ordinary people. An outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Don't we need that, friends? Don't we need that in our land and among our people? So it begins with me. So, so, so where do you start? Well, so old David Guzik, he's a, he's a guy I love to read on, on biblical texts. And when he writes on Habakkuk um, chapter 3, and he talks about this revival that begins with me, it, you know, starting with Habakkuk. Habakkuk, this prophet. What do prophets do? They represent God to the people and the people to God. And so he says, so there are three C's involved here. So as you read that, he says, okay, so, so what would that top C be? There's another C in the, in, the, in the second line and a C down there. So this one is, the top one is, does your walk glorify the Lord as it should? How about your private, what should we put in there? Help me. Begins with a C. Hey? Your conduct. Yeah, your conduct. So this is what happens to you and I when we, we, we realize how small we are in the presence of the Holy God. We, we start checking our conduct. You know, does, does my walk glorify God? Is it true? How about your private conduct? Friends, how about your, how about your private conduct? How about my, what about, what's that second one? Check your, you know what it's going to be. It's another C. What's it going to be? Is your speech profane or impure? Do you talk about Jesus? To, check your, it could be communication. I'm choosing conversation. This is the check that happens, friends. You know, as revival begins with me. What's that last one going to be? Your communion. Hey, you're, you're abiding with Jesus. Are you and I living? Are we growing and abiding with Jesus? Are people seeing Jesus in His church? Are people seeing Jesus in our everyday lives? Because that's where revival begins, friends. We start checking these realities and asking, how am I doing? What's the standard? Well, the standard is perfect Jesus. So there's always going to be work to do, isn't there? And that's what happened in the Western Cape. People started crying out to a holy God in 1860. Was anyone there? So we'll trust the record. How can we make a start today, friends? How can we begin to the, the public change, the national change, the international change. Interestingly, it never begins with a politician. It begins with you and me. It begins with us. It begins with God's church. John chapter 15, that lovely chapter. You know, my father is the gardener. He prunes off every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit. And even those that do bear fruit, he prunes them so they may become more fruitful. That's what happens in revival. Are you still with me, friend? It's growing quiet here. So speaking to people about Jesus, you know, those of us who have had a privilege of visiting Thelma in hospital, that 98-year-old woman who's looking old and frail now, and Rose is here. I think Rose is here because of Thelma. I remember Thelma reaching out to Rose and inviting her to her Bible study. I remember when Thelma, in her 90s, brought Rose to a new members class. How cool is that, friends? In her 90s, bringing people to Jesus. That's just fantastic. And so the reality of God waiting for us, asking us to check our conduct, check our conversation, check our communion with Jesus. And so revival starts with us. But what is the enlightening point of revival? What do we mean by that? What, what is lifted up in times of revival? What does the Holy Spirit pinpoint in times of revival? What comes to the surface in times of revival of God's church, of His people, of what's going on in a nation? 
O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years today. In the midst of the years today, make it known. You could call this the, the, the weak, strong principle. We had the big, small, the weak, strong principle. So those of you who go to gym, who are my gym friends here? Don't be shy. It's okay. Don't be shy. So why are there so many mirrors in the gym? Help me. I've always wondered. Jürgen? Eh? Why are there so many mirrors in the gym? Eh? Why? why? Eh? What's that, yeah? To depress you. To make you work harder. But I've checked those guys in front of those mirrors. Yo, yo and I speed out a grace on my net out. They've been popping tabs and all sorts of stuff, you know, just, just checking themselves out. I'm thinking, is that a real reflection? Is that a real reflection of, of what's going on in your life? Is it? Ali spear and I power and that crack. But inside, you might just be a little person. And so this, this, this weak, strong principle happens when we realize we are weak, but he is strong. And revival starts to happen in our homes and in our lives when we realize we're serving this amazing, powerful, we're surrounded by, by evil and corruption, friends, aren't we? Talking about evil and corruption. So, so I've said to Shiloh, I'm going to share this this morning. So, so, so yeah, yeah, this morning I go out to um, let the dog out. Um, and shame, Liesl's with us. I think she wears Liesl. She's gone, hey, but she... Liesl fell recently. She's um, letting her animals out in, early in the morning, and her whole foot is in a cast, and she is surviving. So nothing quite like that happened to me, but close enough. So, I mean, cats can be evil sometimes. <laughs> Dogs are not really evil, but cats can sometimes be evil. So I'm at the door, and I let the dog out, and there's two cats there. So there's Felix and Jack. Jack, as you know, is, is Jack Sparrow. He takes after that evil pirate. And every now and then, Jack, Jack is evil. So... I'm at the door, and I open the door, and Jack comes forward, and he does this big stretch. He stretches himself out, you know, as cats do, and his one little paw lands on my middle toe, puts his paw on my middle toe, and then he, his, his, what are those things called? His claw, his claw goes into my toe. That's evil. That's just evil. That's just evil. So Shul says to me, no, he was stretching, you know. He was just, you know, I think that's just evil. <laughs> so what happens in these times of revival is that we look deep into our own hearts and we start asking ourselves questions and we realize that we are sinners before a holy God. And God pours out His Spirit. When the Spirit, John 16 verse 13, when the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. Suddenly, when revival happens, uh, and, and what is so key in that text? It's, it's, it's your work, God. Your work. So revival is an act of God, not a human achievement. It's an act of God. And so our role is prayer. What kind of prayer? The appropriate prayer. Because sometimes, you know, we so often pray, Revo revive my work, Lord. You know, do this for me, Lord. My, my agenda. A revival happens when we start praying, your work, Lord, your church. You know what happens? Competition disappears between churches. Churches, they don't compete anymore. They complete each other. That's what happens in revival. Shouldn't we look forward to that, friends? Isn't that what we need? That's how we can start. We can say we can, we can you know, the public change we want starts at a personal level. The truth about Christ, the truth, of, the truth about God being our Father, the truth that we are sinners before a holy God. In the 1860s revival in the Cape, when the, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, when in, in, in Montague and Worcester and Calfinia and Stellenbosch and Wellington and Ceres and Tilbach and Robertson, where my mom was born, in Robertson, the Holy Spirit poured out His work. And there, there wasn't so much prayer in the beginning. But my goodness, when people started realizing they were being missed out, when churches started realizing they were being missed out, you know, it wasn't two or three in the meetings, prayer meetings anymore. They came in their hundreds, friends. They came. And Opi Plaza Langsi Bura 
you know, the workers and the farmers were on their knees before a holy God. Isn't that what our, what our nation needs, friends? Isn't that what our nation needs? And it begins with you and I. And interestingly, Andrew Murray, who was, who was part of it, his father, his father who preceded him, for 36 years, Andrew Murray, Murray's father, on a Friday night, every Friday night, he would pray for revival. It didn't come in his life, it came in his son's life. For 36 years, he prayed and called. So friends, hey, our prayer meetings, how are we doing? Ons geen makkelijk op! So, Andrew Murray's father, and, and the second outpouring, particularly there was a church in Paul, and during a week of prayer in 1861, they, they set aside a, a week of prayer, all the churches, and in particular that church, as they cried out to God in Paul, the revival swept through Paul, and there were hearts that were rending pleas for mercy, and there was soul-wrenching confession of sin, the revival historians tell us. And so Habakkuk has come to this point where he knows that there's only one thing that will bring the public change that he wants. In the corruption and the struggle, it will be revival. And what is that final, what is that tipping point in revival? And so often in revivals, um, unfortunately, the church has restricted revival. And they've got into theological and doctrinal debates. And what will be that tipping point with either a revival continuing or just shrinking? I think it's that last part of the text. In wrath, remember mercy. For we're actually all under God's wrath. If the standard is perfection, if the standard is Jesus Christ, then you know, what are the eternal consequences of that? Without mercy, I'm dead in my sin. Without mercy, I have nothing before a holy God. And in the aftermath of that 1860 revival, there was a clash between van der Lingen and Hofmeyer. Uh, over the handling of the Sunday trains, there was a transport issue. And these two men, there was this conflict, and Satan got his foothold. But they worked through it. And there, there was a battle also within the church between the Orthodox and the liberals. It ended up in court. As humanity got involved. But Andrew Murray and Hofmeyer and van der Lingen, they worked through these things. And van der Lingen was instrumental in translating the Bible into Afrikaans. And from Andrew Murray and Hofmeyer, they established education centers of training and equipping. And there was this massive move right up uh, from there, up into Africa, of missionaries from that revival, friends, of God, black and white, sending out his people. And what is it about God's wrath that makes Habakkuk ask for mercy? It's this understanding as he looks on the land that the Babylonians and God's people are on the same playing field. That God's wrath is going to be poured out on His people, and God's wrath is going to be poured out. Uh, Eileen read the text of Babylon, what happens to Babylon. If the church associates with Babylon, we're under the wrath of God. And friends, what, what happens in, in revival? Um, and Romans 8 verses 1 to 2 this is a slightly different translation. The others talk about there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In this translation, those who enter into Christ's being here for us now no longer have to live under a continuous low-lying black cloud. That's condemnation. That's his translation for condemnation. A low-lying black cloud. Are oh, you maybe there this morning? A new power is in operation. The spirit of life in Christ, like a strong wind, that's the work of the Holy Spirit, has magnificently cleared the air, freeing you from a fated lifetime of brutal tyranny or oppression at the hands of sin and of death. There it is, friends, for you to read. And why does revival start? Because people get a glimpse of the future of heaven. You, call it, you could call it the future now principle. They say, we want something of heaven now. 
and they start crying out to a holy God. So where are you and I today, friends? Will we be part of what God wants to do in this land? Will you let hope arise in your soul this morning? Will you let Jesus Christ speak to you and I? Will you do those checks about conduct, about conversation, about communion with the Holy God? Will we allow God to begin to shake us up and stir us up? Will we say, God, begin with us. Begin with Summer Strand United. Begin with Emmanuel Church. God, you begin your work because we're tired, God. As we look at our own lives and we look at the, you know, the shallowness sometimes of our, of our repentance, God, won't you bring a deep, deep repentance into our lives? Why is it, friends, that we can live free lives before a holy God? Because Jesus on the cross, he was under a low cloud of oppression. This continuous low-lying black cloud, that's what happened to him on Gethsemane. And on the cross, he took all of our sin and our darkness into himself. He took all that private conduct that is not holy in your life and mine. Centuries and centuries and centuries of it. The past, the present, and the future. He took it all onto himself. What a low cloud of oppression was he under. That, that ours may be lifted. Jesus took all of our sin, friends. He took our public sin. He took our private sin. That's why it'll always be far worse for him. It'll be for, why can you live in freedom today? Because he took all of The corruption you're reading about, he took it all into himself. The private sin, the public sin, Jesus took it all. That's why you know, a politician in the last hour or the last moment of his life can say, Jesus, here I am. And Jesus will forgive him. Much as that might seem like injustice, that's what he does. He took all the sin, friends, into himself. And so we're calling on a God who knows us and who knows his people. Won't you read this with me, friends? Come on. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart, with all of my heart. Father, we, we are aware, the Lord, that without you, uh, we have nothing. We are nothing but products of your grace and your mercy. Friends, what is God saying to you and what's he saying to me? Does my walk, does your walk glorify the Lord as it should? Your public conduct. How about your private conduct? How about mine? That place that the Lord only sees. Is he putting his finger on an area of your life and my life? What about what we say? What about our speech? Does the do the, do the conversations we have reflect the love that Jesus has for us? Are we perhaps just putting on a brave show when our lives on the inside are broken? Because there's healing available today, friends. There's the love of Christ available to you, for you and for me today. Therefore, there is no condemnation because Jesus took that condemnation onto himself. He was separated from the Father's love because of your sin and my sin, the sin of his church, the sin of a nation. He took it all on himself, friends. And revival begins when we see a holy God who has taken, you know, a perfect loving Jesus who took all that sin into himself. And our hearts are broken. Once you begin to cry, <coughs> cry out to a holy God in your heart.
for forgiveness, for love, for acceptance, for purity. And just quietly saying, God, I know that I know there are things that are not right in my life. And today is the day you are inviting me to make things right with you. You will seek me as you find me when you seek me with all of your heart.